retraditioning the verse, poetry and performance, chaired by Kale Hotemi. And uh, panelists include, I'll go in order, um, Zara Hushmand, Haf Hafiz Karmali, Amir Baraderan, and our very own Toran Jayi Azarian. So let's give them a welcoming round of applause. just uh, performed the Rumi, we should talk a little bit about the challenges of, of performing such a show. And I, I would say that uh, since, it's, it's, since we're using the word performance in, in, the, in this panel, one of the great challenges of performing poetry of this style is that there's this very mainstream movement since Coleman Barks published all the voluminous variations of Rumi and Deepak Chopra made all those famous DVDs. There's this existing form of recitation, which is very new agey and, and pseudo-reverential, you know? Uh, and so the first thing I said to my actors, to our actors, which is an ensemble of clowns, very well-trained clowns from this, the clown conservatory, dancers, musicians, and so on, was that we wanted to avoid that performance style, that pseudo-reverential style, yeah? Which is why we wanted an immediate performance. Um, and it was very important also, uh, to have children sitting around the stage as well, because I think they are our next hope, our next generation. This morning we talked a lot, and yesterday we talked a lot about these forces in Iran that are, are um, menacing artists. Well, I think we won't ever change that whole generation. The next generation here in America would, I think, benefit from learning a lot more about Iranian poetry. And 
the one overriding message I have for today is I really believe given all the news, uh, very sad news, that, you know, 300 airstrikes in Palestine today, 30,000 dead in Syria so far, 75,000 ground troops invading, reinvading Palestine. By the way, I say Palestine deliberately. Now, why are we so afraid to say Palestine? Why do we have to always use the euphemism West Bank and Gaza? Uh, we put Palestine in the text of the script, if you notice, know, in the Solomon Sea now. Um, what I'm trying to say is that Islam is getting a bad reputation, and Islam needs a sense of humor. For God's sake, you know, if some cook in California produces a terrible, mediocre video of Muhammad, it doesn't mean that Islam and Muhammad uh, ought to be offended. Let's just laugh it off or let's not burn down American flags. Islam should have reacted with, with humor when the caricature came out in Paris about the Pavlovian dog. You know, they showed that Islam responds like a Pavlovian dog to any form of criticism. I think Islam needs to grow up and uh, remember its past. Rumi used to be the most funny, comic, Nasri Dean and so on, the Toranja stage. There's a strain of humor, there's a strain of spirituality, there's a strain of devotional, there's a strain of performance in, 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 in Islam, like the whirling dervishes, like Tazie. Uh, there are body, naughty jokes in Islam. I won't tell you them, but yesterday, <laughs> after Hamid Dabashi's lovely presentation, he and I went outside and shared a couple of dirty, <laughs> <laughs> jokes. In fact, he, he, I told him the English one, I mean my version translated by A.J. Arbery, and, <laughs> or Nicholson, old school translators, yeah. And he said to me in Farsi, the variation, and Halle and the whole gang was witness, witness to it, yeah. So if you'd like to hear, um, we can take a few into a corner and tell you these jokes later. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. They are really worth telling you because, and I also have brought some books with images of um, Muhammad unveiled seated on the Borak, the famous winged horse, on his way to the ascension of the heavens. There are so many misperceptions about Islam. Just don't know where to begin. My life's work is basically, as a member of the Ismaili Muslim community and a follower of the Aga Khan, half my life I've been staging plays for the Aga Khan as a court entertainer, basically. So we've done plays for him and his entourage all over the world for state leaders. The other half or a third of my life happens to be now with Torange and uh, Golden Thread, which I love. There's this labyrinth and Golden Thread that keeps bringing me back here. We've done so many shows together, Torange and I, and I absolutely love her. Since 2006, we've done an Islamic fable. We did uh, three plays. One was about Armenia, the um, um, Armenian genocide, and, and Torange's star, Iranian mother, was in it. Yusuf's plays, I've done two of Yusuf's plays. By the way, Yusuf al Gindi and I went to school together, but we ended up finding each other here. He and I went to Carnegie Mellon and got our MFAs. This is my way of introduction, okay? I'm not telling you my CV, but now you get it, right? <laughs> uh, and what's important is, the other third of my life, I think, is gonna be forming my own theater company, uh, which is gonna be called Theater K. K is the nickname for the Aga Khan, K. And the idea behind all of these uh, thirds is, is to pursue really education and enlightenment on behalf of Islam. And for me, I disagree with you gentlemen and ladies who spoke yesterday on this panel very eloquently about, about religion and drama being separate. Yes, there should perhaps be this thing like they have in Paris where it's naive, secular and, and religion. They are two separate things. But don't forget, please, I ask you not to forget that drama began as a religious ceremony, the Dithyram, in Greece, as songs and odes in praise of the Bacchanalian gods, okay? And that, when I heard that in high school, that really excited me. So for me, drama is a form of devotion. It doesn't mean it has to be religious righteousness or Christian evangelical. It has to be devotion from a spiritual sense, as you saw tonight, I hope, glimpses of it, with humor and intellect. Um, I think I'm ready now to show you some of my work for the Aga Khan, we did a production in 2007 uh, called Ali to Karim, which told the history of the Shia Imams. These are not the same Shia as the 12ers. These are the Shia Ismaili Muslims. And the first image on the screen is from that play, Ali to Karim. And 
basically I'm staying to the, sticking to the theme of the panel. Huh? We, we have literature that I've done research for over seven years for this production, and we had about a year of rehearsal in London with uh, an ensemble of 12 actors. And the scene was a text, thank you. The scene was a text uh, from Persia talking about the Aga Khan's reputation. And it was a sort of gossipy text. And it was written by a French diplomat for his uh, headquarters in Paris. So in rehearsal with the actors, we devised the scene. That's another thing I wanted to talk about, how they asked me to talk about, was how we approach our scenes and staging. So we decided to stage it with this style, which was through improvisation, almost like Les Liaisons Dangereuses, you know, where you have a salon, a French salon, and an effeminate man uh, gossiping. And the text was the text in Farsi or French about the Aga Khan. Next slide, please. This uh, is an example of how we pay tribute to the idea of the book. Today in the Rumi, you would have seen that Islam is a al kitab. Everything we do is to do with the book. We have respect for the book. We're not that avant-garde after all. Everything I tend to do is use the motif of the book. Today you saw Bea reading from the book. Here you had a large book that rotated and there was projection of Persian manuscript painting, which is another thing we tend to do, which is share on stage in performance Islamic art history. And Nasser Khusra, one of the great Iranian poets who has a postage step after him, uh, in Tehran, it's wonderful actually. There's a street called Nasser Khusra Street. Um, this is a poem staged with Nasser Khusra uh, poetry. Next. This is the forces of, uh, this is a poem uh, uh, written in praise of an Imam, Imam al Mahdi, when he conquered Tunisia. And the staging reminds me, or uh, uh, I guess we stage it like a Greek chorus. So the point I'm going to make is we stage things according to our. Um, being, mine is east and west. I would suggest that there's not a choice between east or west, it's cross-cultural, it's east and west. So for example, it's a Farsi poem, or an Arabic poem, I think, in this case, but the staging looks like Iphigenia and Olis, you know, the Greek tragedy, and the Mediterranean Sea. Next. This is a, an example of a, of a manuscript painting of the Seven Sleepers, the legend of the Seven Sleepers. And you know how, do you remember Stephen Sondheim's Broadway musical, Sunday in the Park with George, uh, Sora, and so on? They took the Sunday in the Park with George painting that's in Chicago, they took that painting and brought it to life. Similarly, we took a manuscript painting, uh, which was a scripture from the Quran, and there are hundreds of poems on the story, and staged it precisely like that, a dance theater piece, which was poetry in performance. Next. This is the burning of the library. The Mongols devastation of Iranian literature. And so these images, I think, whether we're talking about the past or present, uh, we can make links. And this is my attempt to talk about what we've been talking about yesterday and today, the obscurantism, the Taliban destroying the Buddha, uh, and so on. And the people uh, who want to, wouldn't allow the Iranian filmmaker to make this film. And finally, uh, two more shots. This is a, an image of, I think, the, there are two more, I think, No, Drew? Anyway, not meant to be. One of them was from Conference of... Ah, yes. But this is from Conference of the Birds that I recently performed in, in, uh, in Vancouver and like to convince Torrance to bring here. It's of a bat, an image of a bat, totally deluded, and in the darkness, he's looking for the sun. You know? Uh, and so the, the text by Atar, Atar was a master before Rumi, and he's written wonderful epic tales and poems. We would love to bring them to the stage. Finally, if you have a shot of the previous shot, uh, Drew? No. Okay, fine. It's a shot of the contents of the birds with the hoopo played by a ballerina. And there you had an encounter between East and West, Western forms, which are a balletic form to tell the story of a Persian epic. Okay? I think if I'm over my time, you may tell me. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to go next to Zara Kushman. Is she going to talk about her? I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about my work with Bijan Lafitte's first.
Um, my own background is in English literature and especially poetry, but my background in theater comes very much from studying with Bijan Mufi, um, who uh, was probably the greatest Iranian playwright and a very fine director of the 20th century, um, who moved to Los Angeles shortly after the revolution and passed away there in 1984. Um, if you are Iranian and younger and don't know this work, I suggest you get right on YouTube and look up Shadok Hussein because this is, this is the source of modern Iranian theater. Um, he is to Iranian theater today what Nima Yashij was to Iranian poetry. And you really have to know this work, it is amazing. Um, I worked with him first as a translator and then I produced some of his plays in Los Angeles. And his masterpiece, his best known work, which is called Shadow de Say, City of Tales, um, he insisted that it was untranslatable. And so that cannot be represented. <laughs> but it is, um, it uses uh, just a wealth of material from popular poetry, from classical poetry. He takes nursery rhymes, folk tales, um, Ruhozi, which is the Iranian version of Comedia dell'arte, which is actually much more verbal than physical comedy. Um, and all of these very traditional forms, and he blends them into something that is a masterful satire of Iranian culture, and politically loaded and spiritually loaded. Um, but, like I said, untranslatable, so we didn't even go there. Um, <laughs> but I did translate three other of his plays. Um, one which was called in Farsi, Sorabo Aska Sanjoka. We translated it as Dragonfly and produced it in Los Angeles just before his death in 1984. And it was a story of Sorab and Rostam from the Shahnameh. Uh, Bijan's father had been a Nagal performing the, uh, the Shahnameh in traditional form and had forbidden his son ever to go into theater, but that's another story. Um, but he used the, the Nagal tradition and he told the story of Sarab and Rostam interwoven with modern scenes from Vietnam, Africa. Uh, the story repeated in the same way that you have the sense of the father killing the son is something that will happen again for each generation. It was a profoundly anti-war play. Um, and it had this, you know, I was using the epic tradition, uh, translating those bits of poetry weaving the modern scenes in. And the critics uh, didn't get it. It was like, what is this sort of archaic language that's woven in amongst the modern scenes? Um, there was a lack of understanding that this was referencing something in a way that the Iranian audience totally knew where it was coming from. That has been my biggest challenge. Um, another, uh, another translation um, we did the story of the moon and the leopard, uh, a children's play, Shaharat Khanu and the Butterfly. In each case, he's using, he's pulling on traditional forms, and the lack of reference is the first challenge. There's, there's, no, um, there's no way to create that universe without sort of doing a lot of explanation. And so you've got to leave it in, in subtle ways. You've got to, you know, trade-offs. Um, and prices to be paid. Um, one thing I found, generally speaking, in terms of presenting Iranian poetry to American audiences, and this also comes not only from my work with Bijan Mofid's work, but with the translation of Rumi, is American poetry, as it stands today, has a fear of the sonic qualities of poetry. You can use assonance, you can use slant rhyme, you can use subtle rhythms, but anything, you know, you want to actually use rhyme, it's like, we don't go there anymore. And that's not what modern American poetry does. I think part of the problem is that American poetry has so emphasized the lyrical, the inward looking, they've forgotten um, the epic tradition. And I think that has a much closer relationship with what's possible in theater and the roots of theater. And again, this is another challenge that needs to be fought. Um, and it's as if you were to say, as a musician, well, I think the, you know, the major scale is sort of overused, let's just not do that anymore. 
in the way that they have just dropped all rhyme and any you know, explicit, uh, stronger forms of rhythm. The, there are exceptions that you have now with um, uh, yesterday's uh, the end Well, I was going to bring that up and say, Toran, in directing stuff, maybe recognize that challenge of using rhyme and you made it hip-hop. Mm -hmm. In a form yeah. which is taken over poetry being a country, I'm sure, by right. leaps and bounds, and for better or for worse. So. But it remains yeah. outside the mainstream. I mean, it's recognized. It's outside, it's, it's, it's outside of the academy. Um, what I did find in terms of working from Bijan Mofid's work was there is another level of sound architecture in the place that works much as poetry does. And, um, you know, we're used to the idea of uh, sound design will reference a place, you know, you go south of the border and the guitars come out, uh, the monkey goes to India and the sitar, you hear. <laughs> and we're used to the idea of music as background that gives an emotional force, um, which we've learned from film and has been adapted to theater. What Guillermo Fi did in this work is to carry that much farther. So you have echoes of sound and patterns of sound that work very much like the internal architecture of poetry. Um, and it becomes uh, a soundscape for the play. And it also has becomes a moral landscape for the play. Of, for example, in the children's play, um, Butterfly, Chocolate Plume, the Butterfly meets a series of different characters, and to save her own skin, she, with great difficulty, brings herself to tell a lie in each situation. And the, the rest of the characters that are on stage as a sort of chorus just gently start singing, just in the background. And that's to say, she's telling the truth, she's telling the truth, but of course she's not. And the echoing of that creates its own chorus, its own pattern. Um, another aspect that was very characteristic of Bijan's work was he would um, he would create an image of the society that he was describing by having all the characters on stage all the time, and they would have their each separate areas, and they would continue with their small business, um, their occupation, you know, the. the uh, the carpenter is sawing, um, the moneylender is counting money, and these actions, which represent a sort of a, a character in the bigger picture of the society he was drawing, but also they have the characteristic sounds. And those sounds become foreground or background and build their own music and work together um, as, again, like poetry, a sort of a, a sonic echoing architecture that has its own structure, and, and that very much, I think, um, is very translatable. So, for example, in The Moon and the Leopard, where you have the, um, the characters beginning to stone the moon to, um, to send her back to the sky, and that chanting as the stoning builds up, and at the same time, you have the colonel counting the money um, that has been paid off from the CIA, and it's the backstory for this whole thing. Uh, I, I, I should have told you the stories of all these movies, but I think I'm yeah. writing, I'm probably writing everything else. You're good, you're good. Um, I just remind, okay. reminder to thank you, reminder to everyone that this complex is Project Arcto. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes. the last panel, uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was Roberta, so that you know, exchange is an oxygen for art, and I think cross genre work and the kind of soundscape you're describing is that kind of what Arcto said the theater does. Amir, and please tell us who you are. Thank you. Because this noble one did not. It's a bias in your program, so people did. Um, I, I'm your um, I do multi-media performance art. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> 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 you didn't mention the rules or, or these things, but anyway. <laughs> Um, you had a show just last night, no? The, 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 ask Heather to send you all the emails. <laughs> she still loves this. Um, I wanted to, um, I mean, I'm very much humbled to be on this panel because I am not a performing artist. Um, neither have I had training in theater or anything of the 
story, which seems to be very much the um, focus of this um, conference. So, um, what I do perhaps, is, or part of the thing, kind of thing I do is, is mainly called performance art. And um, to draw perhaps um, some modern um, um, origin of, of this, we can talk about um, perhaps Dadaism, Situationist, um, installation art, and things of the sort. So, um, it, it's, it, you know, there's no one definition of it perhaps, um, but um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that's very ephemeral, that's very, um, that's not there to be sold perhaps, it's only to be viewed once. So it, it kind of goes against, it's actually an antithesis of, of theater. So it's funny for me to be here. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> so I wanted to, you could have um, my first um, photo. This is how we are, we, are, we are used to see gallery exhibitions, right? So there's one image, a lot of space around, it's very stoic, it's very sterile. Actually, this image comes from a, a place that's called White Cube, which is a very prominent gallery in, in London. Um, and this is the, the way it's set up. And if you go back to the history, we have another way of um, placing, so if you look at it, um, image number two, which is called Salon style hanging which is in the Louvre and uh, many other places. So here is the, the kind of shifts and tensions that have been happening throughout time in the way in which we understand perhaps art, moving away from the convoluted, hectic, busy to the more stoic, stereotype way of doing it. And that is also perhaps true in terms of performance art. So someone like me who comes to the performance art and brings about sound, movement, poetry, um, makes it convoluted. So I don't, so it's going against the movement of the nowadays called performance art. And that's a kind of an interesting challenge. So I'm bringing poetry into it as a way of um, counterbalancing the way in which 
the so-called performance art is being utilized right now. So performance art, and I don't want to generalize, I mean like there are tons of different ways of doing performance art, and concurrently there are tons of them at the same time around the world. But the more canonical work, you know, such as the work of Magna Abramov, which we see through her work how things have changed and shifted. So um, things are sterile, so she isolates all the elements of a performance. So she doesn't talk, she doesn't interact like physically, though she used to do that a long time ago. And she, per, for example, exchanges energy with you, which is a very esoteric way of, um, of uh, performing, but at the same time, it's, it's somehow new aging kind of thing as, at the same time. So when I did, uh, when I was sitting at, when she was sitting at my, um, are, are you familiar with Marina Abramovich, a performance art, yeah. some of you? No? Yes. Okay, so when she was at MoMA, and they were paying yeah. homage to her for 40, 40 years of work, um, she sat there and people would sit across from her, and it was supposed to be an interactive, non-verbal, non-physical, interactional um, exchange of energy between the two. Um, so here she was planning to get into um, a certain um, uh, spiritual moment, in which she, she gets into a trance, and that's why she was able to sit there truthfully for three months, eight hours a day, non-stop. Um, and when I infiltrated MoMA, and I, and I did a whole, with like 30 people who got in, and we did all kinds of crazy things, which you can see on my website. Um, when I did this, the, one of the acts that I played with her was called the other trance. So her, her um, you know, here, here she was, presenting this moment of trance as stoic, sterile, non-verbal. And for me, in my culture, or at least the way, what I perceive to be as my culture, going through trance happens in, through movement, chanting, and, and being convoluted, and, 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 and noisy, and everything that comes with it. So that, there was the tension that I was trying to create, and I think that comes off in a lot of the performances I do. So that moment of trance to which I get by bringing about poetry that allows me to get into that. If you could play um, uh, video number one. <laughs> Non-sterile and non-partisan, you know what I mean? Um, 
pieces through that technology where I was able to place my own performance in the Louvre. Louvre cannot take it out right now because there's a lot of litigation around it. There's no legal jargon, international legal jargon about it, and therefore that space is undefined and therefore I'm allowed to be in the Louvre without Louvre being able to take it out. So that was the Mona Lisa I used. If you want to go back to the previous one, now to do this technology um, that I use, I, I use poets around me, and this is the kind of poetry that we have. Um, we basically, um, I was going to read you the whole poetry and going to fascinate you, but, <laughs> but the whole idea is that actually this is, this is coding, this is programming, you know. Um, but it's, it, for me it's very interesting because that interaction that I have with my coder, with my poetry writer, with my poet that I call, that technology is that only thinks about the way in which that robustness of the technology will happen. I think there's something metaphysical that happens through that interaction with me, and, that, and I love to call my, my um, coders and programmers my poets. So this is a line of poetry that you see here, to do the kind of thing I did with them. Um, so that's a good poetry. One more minute. Um, I want to do, um, I want to tell you guys about, um, in line with augmented reality, um, what I have realized is that it allow, without falling into a very determin uh, technological determinism, perhaps, um, I'm capable of, of, not that I'm capable, but, but what I'm hoping for is to look at um, poetry that I utilize in, in embodying that, those movements, but also reciting poetry to create some kind of an extension, to, to think about that poetry as an extension of the soul of technology. And I'm referencing here, um, for those of you who are familiar with like futurism, futurism and futurists um, from 19, early 1920s, um, 1907 perhaps, like the first um, futurist manifesto we have, here they are perhaps the most deterministic technologists we have in, on, on the contemporary mind in terms of the art world. And uh, they're sitting, the way they write their manifesto is by, by describing how they're, uh, they're, um, they, they're, they're sitting on a Persian carpet and, and they go into these metaphysical moments of interaction with technology and they trans like things. So even at that very particular moment of looking at technology as the savior of the world and, and you know, how things are determined in that way, you see those interactions that happen. So it's, when, when I use poetry, and you're gonna see that perhaps in the next video, if you could place the next video, you're gonna see how I utilize these kind of poetry to center myself in order to play with the type of technology that I play with that leaves usually very little space for esotericism or um, spirituality in a way. So,
my merchandise of all things contemptible, the most vile. end on that. 
ahead of my time just to serve your time. <laughs> Thank you. I have questions, but I really do want to throw it back to you. So let's have let's have your comments and questions.
fantasy and distance. And one of the first American productions, we decided to translate this, and the Shadow Hat and he became a television creature. And he had his little TV on a little leash that he dragged behind him, and he was preaching. Um, and you know, that made sense in terms of you know, a translation of context. Um, but you're, you're always pushing back against assumptions, expectations, um, especially about them. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of already answered the question, sort of, but I'll ask it again. Um, do any of you on the panel work in, I mean, it seems that a lot of the work you've been doing, um, translating poetry into a theatrical experience, has to do with uh, older models, classical models, Rumi, etc. Uh, are, are there contemporary living poets that you work with now uh, who are uh, right, who you are working with, who specifically are writing about the current political situation in Iran, or any country for that matter? Well, as I said, Simin Behbani is a living poet, and she uh, she writes many of her poems have to do. What's her name? Simin Behbani. Um, she's in her eighties, and. Uh, she did one no. But she's of the Abbehan, he's of Shiraz, you know. Um, and she's uh, very critical of, of the Islamic government. I think, you know, for the most part, they leave her alone, but she was arrested a couple of times. Um, when I wanted to uh, direct I Sell Souls, I contacted her and asked her permission to do it. I also ran the translation by her. It's uh, from a published anthology of her poetry, and I had a problem with a couple of the word choices, because as you know, translating poetry is probably one of the most difficult um, uh, jobs, I think, because um, there's so many choices this, that you have to make. Was the anthology created there in Iran? No, the anthology was published in the U.S., um, so I had the original poem in Persian, and I had the translation in English, and I had some questions about why certain things were translated in a particular you know, about war choices, basically. And she gave me permission to make some changes. Um, and yeah, and she was very pleased with the work I sent her the DVD. Um, I just want to add two, two things, two cents. I also worked on a translation that was performed. It was performed in Persian. Um, and the poet was Kasrai, who died in 1996, he's dead, but he's not I'm a classical writer. And, but it was performed in Persian, the whole thing, and mine was just in the program for, for the reader's sake. Um, but it was also based on Shafami and modernized. And so it's a very, it's called the Scarlet Stone. And so they were playing with revolution times, they were playing with Shafami, they were playing with um, modern composition of music. It was an interesting experience, but it is something contemporary, and, and the person sitting next to you has done a lot of contemporary translation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, I mean, Tamam wasn't in uh, what didn't rhyme, uh, I sell souls. I mean, these are mod you know, mod modern poems, so all those stuff was written in rhyme. We have some more time, so more questions. Oh, comment. Uh, a comment really about stuff. Uh, it, it was so wildly inventive and playful and theatrical. I'm a little surprised, and, and to hear you say that you were, you know, uh, open to what the two actors are doing. Was it in auditions or rehearsal? I mean, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm surprised that you say you don't really consider yourself a director because I think all of us should. Inspired to be both well, so open to the happy accidents that that happen, as well, well as some ideas as, of what I wanted to do. Yeah, and, and but really bold theatrical ideas, and to you know devise them and execute them so wonderfully playfully. I, I just thought it was really exciting. So that's not really a question. Well, look, that was the one with the James Bond. Yeah, yeah. Like, where did you? That was fantastic. Well, you know, I mean, it made sense, but I still wonder how you. What process sort of led to that? Because it made sense, but it was still very unusual and great. Yeah, it's you know, 
it's, it, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that as refugees we return to the nations that have instigated the tragedy, right? So, um, he, where does he go as a refugee? He goes to England, he goes to the US, those are the countries that he aspires to be a citizen of. And how, how is that mindset shaped? It's shaped by Hollywood. At least for me it was, right? So I mean, I, I don't, um, I don't um, associate with you know, Elizabeth Taylor or Michelle Pfeiffer, or I associate with 007. <laughs> <laughs> He's my hero, so so I, I you know I want to introduce myself as Bond, James Bond. You know? So for me, it was a very easy, you know, it was like the, this is this is the ticket, this is the selling point, and the whole um, image of him being sucked into that video um, and then being rejected, you know, like that's the promise. Also with the Arab nations, the promise is you know the wealth in Dubai or the um, you know, the touristy uh, offerings uh, in Syria or the security in Jordan. So those are the promises, but their reality is the rejection. Thank you. I actually don't know if I have enough of a voice to, to ask the question, but since Octavia asked, um, since you mentioned um, translations of the contemporary um, poets, um, there are other living poets that um, have been performed, um, specifically the show that you, you've seen already, um, the video of that was actually performed on this very stage, which was um, Icarus Rise, which is a performance that um, uh, incorporated 10 people, including myself as the narrator, of uh, poetry by living poets that are um, our age, uh, anywhere between the ages of 32 to, um, I think, about 75 or 76, um, which I have compiled together for an anthology, and some of some of which I performed here. Those poets are called, uh, and I'll give you the names, but the, the youngest ones are, um, the wonderful ones are Ziba Kavasi and Maria Hule, who write incredibly personal and yet extremely um, socially oriented and political poetry um, that resonates. The other thing I wanted to share is what, what Zara was saying about uh, her challenge as well as what Torah was saying about her challenge in terms of uh, com coming up against um, reactions and, and the work that they do, not falling into um, any neat category. I have the same, I continue to have the same challenge with um, contemporizing and uh, performing, translating and performing poetry in that I think it's a sort of a new genre in the, in the traditional sense of theater. So if there is any engagement with theater companies, uh, because it's uh, the dramatization of, of poetry as, as vital and, and uh, dynamic as it might be, it doesn't really fall into a new category of theater. And at the same time, it doesn't really fall into the category of a poetry reading um, with the very, very, very much more limited resources that uh, places that uh, present poets and poets, uh, poetry readings have to offer. And then the other thing about hip hop theater was that since, since performing poetry is a very ancient and, and beloved and, and well practiced uh, uh, form of uh, expression in Iran, mainly with Nathalie and other uh, forms, similar forms. Um, I always thought that also hip hop was a great analog for it, but then I also came up with a challenge there as well is that the hip hop community, the hip hop theme community doesn't really necessarily see that as a root that's shared. So I just want to express sympathy with all of you guys in terms of not being able to fall anywhere and not being able to sort of infiltrate the more um, established traditions that are not Western traditions here. I think it's a uniquely American problem. I went to school in England and we learned to perform poetry as part of your sort of basic dramatic training. You had Shakespeare, I mean, and that was just, you know, that was what you grew up with and internalized. It's a uniquely American thing that you get up on stage to read your new poem and you do this droning trance. <laughs> Right. Just a thought on that point. Um, in terms of contemporary poetry, my simple contribution on that point would be I, 
I guess I'm sinful, I've done nothing but dead poets and playwrights. <laughs> but if you, like in the Rumi, uh, because the actors were so talented, they suggested singing the last poem of our Rumi's death and funeral being celebrated as a wedding. Um, and they started playing a jazzy tune um, with trombone and trumpet and so on. Uh, doesn't that count now as re Rumi reinvigorated as a contemporary poet? It's interesting. I uh, performed a short piece uh, in a classroom. Can you take um, can you think Napoli? Because you did Napoli. So epic poetry in in Persian uh, was often performed by a storyteller, often in coffee shops. Um, and this person uh, uh, would perform all the different parts, and you know, it's kind of a, um, a demonstration. Um, um, Nora's telling me to do shows with that, uh, Kali. Uh, and when, uh, when in our fairy tale players in Golden Thread, we actually used that Kali initially in most of our performances, where we would begin with uh, you know, a big, um, big clap like an Atal would, and uh, recite the beginning of the Shah and, um, and when I did that in a classroom, I was actually surprised by one of the students saying, wow, that sounds like, you know, hip hop or, you know, and so I don't know if people necessarily think of it as having common roots, but I think it, you know, it resonates and it's something recognizable and it's something that, you know, is easily shared. So that was exciting. Yeah, we have, uh, thank you, we have two minutes left, but I wanted to just quickly um, go back to the point about and I interpreted as knowing how hard it was for you to select the poets in your anthology, like those choices and the criticism you get from choosing one another, I didn't get a chance to ask you about the choices you made of the poems and the poetry. That's for over cocktails or something else, or to whatever your choice is. Um, we have time for, I think, one more. Uh, my question for each of the panelists was, um, in each of your mediums, when do you feel like uh, one a piece is um, ready for performance um, or, or is ready to be launched? And when um, do you feel like a piece is finished? <laughs> for the first question, opening night. <laughs> and the second question, never. <laughs> yes, in a way, I agree. <laughs> or I guess to be more specific, what components are present that then, apart from the deadline? <laughs> but what is it, I guess I'm, I'm curious, what each of you, um, and particularly you, I mean, what, what is it that you look for that tells you that, um, it, you know, especially with living formats, um, what, what's present for you, what's there for you, uh, in the year in which you're working that sort of signifies to you, you know, I'm ready to share this or I'm ready to move on from this? Um, I, I think I'll go along with what they were saying. Um, I would say it's never finished and it's ready when it's, actually you don't want it to be ready. At least the kind of work I do, I want it to be unfinished and un unproduced and undone and that's when I would present it. So it's that desire for it's the antithesis of the finished work that I'm interested in. Yeah. So there's a con it's, it, the work is presentable, mm. and then the work is done. The work is never done, I think, but it's present. You get it to a point that it's presentable, that you're happy with how far it's come or with what the public will see. But um, for example, with Tamam by Abedi Shamia, I, I directed that piece twice. With different actors and musicians, and while um, there were similarities in how I directed it, it was, com again, it was really informed by the actors, so it ended up being a very different presentation. And if we had more time, we would have, you know, continued to experiment with doing particular moments differently, or maybe making a more um, uh, com complex musical uh, response to, to the poetry. So deadlines are important to you. Speaking of deadlines, <laughs> my panel, they are so kind and warm and good. And so I think if you have additional questions, I encourage you to talk to them. Any? Jay, is that a question or you're just mm -hmm. a um, 